when I started doing these rankings battles, I didn't expect that I'd be discussing Joel Embiid. But here we are. We're going to be talking him, Walker Kessler, Mark Williams, and DeJounte Murray. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and we are available on all platforms. So, I'm going to be joined by Alex Raclean of RotoWire. He's done this show with me for about the last three or four years. We always get into some spirited debates and I look forward to this one again with Alex, and actually, as we were, before we get... Actually, no, no, I'll tell the story when he's on. We'll get to that in a second. So, hey, let's get Alex here. All right, here he is. He's back on the show. We're doing this again for another year. Alex Raclean is here to debate our fantasy rankings. Alex, I was just about to tell a story before you came on about how you sent me the, the message regarding this show, and you went, man, I actually don't disagree with you as much this year, which is a surprise given some of the, uh, the big differences we've had in our uh, opinions in previous years. Yeah, I actually believe that this, um, you doing these sort of ADP battles, if you will, I believe that they started because you and I disagreed so often that you were like, Reclaim, we've got to just patch some of these out. That's probably uh, true. And you kind of expanded it in the years past. I think that's um, probably, I think when you did the first one, it was maybe two, two shows that we did. It was you and maybe somebody else. And then we expanded it out to other people. But yeah, I think that's part of yeah. part of what, uh, what, what brought this to a four, which is about four or five years ago now, probably. Um, you know, Alex has been on the show many times. You see him all around the fantasy community working at RotoWire. And when I, I said this at the start of this show as well, before you got on, when I set this out and said that we're going to be looking at rankings and people can you know, criticize and have a go at me and go hard, whatever you want to do. I, the last name I thought I was going to be hearing, Alex, was the big fella in Philadelphia, and that's Joel Embiid. But apparently you've got a problem with greatness. So tell us, what's what's going on? I've got Embiid at two. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got him at two, and I've sort of been flip-flopping between him two and three. But you, even you go, that's like that's crazy, Josh. What, what are you doing? So what, what's the problem? I, I just, I don't... I think that that's too high. I, I think that asking Embiid to recreate what he did last year, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, he's 29. He's at 14,000 career minutes. Those are points at which we do start to see some drop off, especially from, you know, physical bigs. Uh, that was the point at which uh, Steven Adams career started taking a turn um, J- um jv's defensive stats started taking a turn at a very similar time gobert's block started falling off at 29 uh clint capella is like a slightly different kind of player slightly different build he's not even um, that old yet is he? He, he no his his drop off started at 26 mm. um but like you look at his basketball reference page and you can you can see it mm. and so at expecting Embiid to even match his career best at this point it doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, and, and, and there are a number of, of elements to that. Um, you know, there's his situation. He's got the MVP now and he flamed out in the playoffs. So sort of his, his regular season white whale that he was chasing is gone. And the goal is playoff success and, and him chasing the MVP uh, appears to have seems like it might have hurt that um he's coming off career highs in field goal percentage and free throw percentage you are one of many people who talks about how that's something that is likely to regress towards his career average Mm -hmm. and i think that it is almost a lock that um his career highs in minutes and career highs in usage from last year are both going to drop off at least a little bit they might not be big, but just a little bit is enough to knock him from two down a couple of spots. Um, okay. 
And, and then the, the last point I just wanted to make is, is part of how he's so high is because he was the number one player uh, after the all-star bake for the, in fantasy for, for about a month. Yep. Um, but if you look at going back to the lockout, if you look at basketball monster Z scores, um, he had the lowest league leading post all-star game Z score total um, of that whole time. or second lowest of those 13 years or however many it was. So he was the best fantasy player for two months last year, but historically that level of production, even if he were able to recreate it, it's not, it's, it's not usually quite what we expect from fantasy's number one player. I, okay. A couple, couple so of things. A lot there. Co- yeah. A couple of things with that. <laughs> the, the thing about the value of him being smaller than anyone else post all-star break is interesting because I, you've, you're bringing me this number now. I, I hadn't heard that before, which is interesting. But what my general subjective view on, on all that is, is I think that at the moment in fantasy, we are seeing suppressed top level values in general because of the way that there is, there's more concentration in some bigger numbers at the top, but there's also just, I think, more talent around the NBA as well. And that's enabling, and with players missing some more games, it's enabling more players to step into usage roles for 10 or 20 game zones. And we're not seeing that one guy who, Jokic was number one, but he's not like blowing people away the way that Steph did in 2016 or Harden did in 2019. Like that sort of singular dominant guy doesn't seem to have been around as much. So, and, and we know that Zed scores, it's all dependent on what everyone else does. It's not just what your numbers do. Right. You, you can do the exact same thing year on year and your value is different. So him being that lower number, I think there's part of that is you're right that it wasn't as dominant as others, but it's also the fact that there is other players performing that well. Now, one thing I want to say on this is I the 29 is absolutely my line in the sand that there's going to be some level of decline in a player. I've got no question with that at all. It happens in basically every player. You now, whether the decline goes like that or it goes like that, Usually for right. the good players, it, it's it's the steep ones come at 33, right? Or 34, but yeah. it decreases. And I think that you're right about the field goal percentage. I think you're right that the block rate could fall off. I don't agree with you on usage and minutes though. Nick Nurse, he's, a, he's crazy, right? Like even if he's not going to say, he's not going to play him 28 minutes. He's not going to say, Joel, you know what? I, re- I really trust my bench. I'm really going to just go. He's going to say, he already came out and said, no, I think we need to play Joel more. Like Nick, calm down, but this is what he's going to do. And the usage thing, I don't know that that's necessarily going to drop. But I have would have no problem if somebody else took um, Halliburton at two or who do you, actually, who do you have it to then? I have Doncic at two and Halliburton at three. Well, I go back and forth between Halliburton and SGA at three and four, um, but I usually have Halliburton three and I actually, SGA I, four. This is uh, the reason this was interesting because you chose that you wanted to pick me having Embiid at, at two. And earlier today, I did a mock draft and I said, like, Jokic goes at one. But the next four guys, I actually don't think there's that much of an of a issue with Halliburton, Shea, or Doncic going two, three, four, five, and Embiid. Like, whatever. I wouldn't want to put you know, Tatum up into that group. But if I knew Steph was going to play 70 games, I'd put him into that group, into that top yep. mix as well. So I don't have, Agreed. yeah, you got him at five, whatever. N- not a big problem. It's just more just the, the little interesting details, I guess, in that where I, I don't think minutes and usage are decreasing, but I think that there is a significant risk of a of an efficiency drop considering he shot, what, six or seven percentage points better from two last season than he had at other points in his career. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a career best by, I think, 4%. And it was better than the year before by like five or six yeah. percent. Um, I, I just to be clear, like I think that the minutes drop off is going to be very small. I think that the usage drop off is going to be very small. But I do, you know, if you set those as the betting lines with even odds on either side, I'm taking the under on both, um, which I think is just gonna when you add that to what I expect to be even just a modest decline. I agree. Embiid is absolutely in the top five. I do sort of put my teardrop before him. Okay. I have him closer to the Steph group than to those other three. Uh, but I, I, I also just wanted to highlight him because I wanted to push back. There are some in the industry who are saying he's the clear two. And and I wanted to push back on that a bit. Yeah, a few weeks ago, I did a show like my, the top 20 picks, and I think I had Halliburton at two in that show. And I, I've been going back and forward between those groups. So yeah. I actually don't have too much of a problem with it, but it is an interesting discussion point. Um, especially, I, I saw a comment on a video yesterday that said, uh, picking Joel Embiid at two is insane. I go, okay, well, it's probably not insane, but 
you know, probably not. It's probably not insane, <laughs> but you know, we we uh, we can have differing opinions. We're going to get back <laughs> and talk about the next guy in just a second. But today's episode. It is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. And you get, as a new customer, $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. It's a sad time over here because I was really telling everybody that the Dolphins were going undefeated. Tua was winning MVP, we're winning the Super Bowl, and I've been humbled. So I can't go out there and tell you to put those Super Bowl bets on, although I didn't tell you to do that last time, but whatever what you want to do, spreads, player props, over-unders, money lines, it's all there over on FanDuel. So go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, kick off the NFL season. FanDuel is an official partner of the NFL. Don't forget to gamble responsibly. <sighs> okay. I have no problem with the Dolphins Super Bowl bet right now. There you go. We're, we're back. We're back in. We're back in. <laughs> let's, um, let's go to the second one because we are talking big men. This is the first of two big men that we're going to be talking about, Alex. And it is the CLT legend himself, Mark Williams in Charlotte. I've got him around that round six, round seven range. You've got him around round eight. So back to, you don't have him quite where Yahoo initially ranked him in the 330s, but you've got him in that area. His ADP is 110. That's a fake ADP. It's going to come in significantly from there. I think he's going to settle in around the range that you've got him around 90. Can I preempt an argument that you've got here for Mark? I'm ready to preempt something for you. Um, Steve Clifford's going to run a center rotation um, and split the minutes with a timeshare. And PJ Washington is going to play small ball center. Am I close? Um. You're um, you're close, but not. You're missing a key detail, which which is is the trust. I'm not saying I think that's going to happen. I'm just saying that very well might. And for sixth round ADP, the risk of that is way too high, uh, especially when I think you can get him later. Oh, um, well, you hundred percent can, yeah. Um, so. So yeah, you're on the right track, but you were going to rebut it. So you can rebut it. You can pre-butt it, and then I can sort of. Go. I think you're. Yeah, look, I, I do have him in that you know, late late sixties, early seventies range, but I don't think I'd ever need to take him there. And like I will always say, I might have a guy there, and I don't be like I have to get Mark Williams under all circumstances. I have to get if someone wants to be dumb enough and reach up and get him at sixty, eliminating all value and taking a little bit of top. I, I think there's actually top side for him to be top fifty. I don't think it's going to happen, right? But I'm not taking him at 60. If I can get him at 80, I love that. But if I don't, I'll just get somebody different. It's not about me reaching up to that spot. It's just that when I look at the numbers and what he's able to do, because he's not a disaster from the free throw line. He's not awesome, but he's not a disaster there. I think there is, and maybe I'm putting a little bit too much faith in this as well, which we're going to talk about faith in a little bit of a second when we talk about your big man that I'm going to yell at you about. I think he can block more shots. He blocked more shots at Duke. I think it was weird to see how much it declined when he entered the starting lineup last season. Whether that's real or not, I honestly don't know. We'll find out about it. But I'm not worried about big dick Nick Richards coming and stealing minutes from him. And Steve Clifford played PJ Washington like zero minutes at center last season. And PJ six foot eight. And Steve does not like those small ball centers. Now, there is a little bit of a scenario where there are extra forwards around, so maybe he needs to do it. I think that if that does happen, it'll be at the expense of Richards, not at the expense of Williams. I'm not expecting him to play 33 a night, 28, 29, 30, around that mark. I think it's going to be fairly rock solid with him getting those minutes. Big rebound guy, big field goal guy. You're going to get over a block, I'm really confident. I'd be more confident. Or I'd say there's more likely that he gets two blocks and he gets one block, which is the sort of the number that he put up as a starter last season. So I'm just expecting as a second-year guy, more confidence, comes into training camp as the starter, and can put up some okay numbers in those rounds. Again, probably a guy I target in the 80s, and I feel confident about getting, about not losing any any value if he, if he busts there. I don't think that's going to happen at, at that sort of spot. What do you think of that? So, I mean, I... I agree with you on a lot. I love the player. I don't know if you remember this, but last year we also debated Mark Williams and you complained that I was too high on him. Yes. Um, which I think we kind of both won that one because it took way longer than I had hoped for him to play. But once it's, he finally did Steve play, Clifford. I think, Steve Clifford factor, I think, I think, I think we, we kind of both won that one. Um, but so I agree with you. I love the player. And I, I do think that he is capable of absolutely improving in many ways from last year. Um, but I don't, I just really, 
do not trust this coaching staff to do things that I am going to be able to accurately anticipate. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, uh, so it, he, it really took forever long after he had clearly shown that he was better than Nick Richards. It still took Nick Richards and a bunch of other players getting injured for him to finally give Mark Williams those minutes. I don't think, I don't think that's actually true. I, I think what this is why, how I remember it, maybe I'm wrong on this is that, they do this with the rookies. He put him in the G League and all this time. He came back in. He basically immediately jumped Richards to be the backup. Plumley got traded. Williams became the starter. And then over the final, he had then he had the thumb issue where he had tore that thumb ligament. And then mm-hmm. over the final ten games, they just went into full tank mode. They said, "Whatever, we're just going to rotate centers and we'll just do whatever." Kai Jones, Nick Richards, we're just going to rotate it to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it wasn't really indicative of how they view the position. And that's from me talking to Hornets people as well. With like that, that was just some bullshit. Last ten games, let's try and get as bad as we can and see what actually happens with these guys. Okay. But in that little period of time, post trade deadline, before he hurt his thumb. He was rolling at like a 29 and a game, 28 a game, and Richards would play 19, 20. And that sure. is the belief that I have that I've, that I've been told as well is that that's how they plan to run that rotation. So it, and part of my concern with Mark Williams is the Hornets have a sort of surprisingly deep oh, um, sort of wing rotation, especially like big wings, mm-hmm. you know, PJ, Miles Bridges, Brandon Miller, Gordon Hayward, um they jt thor is he really going to get zero minutes at all um and you know terry rogier and Lamelo ball seem sort of locked in at like 33 plus yep. so i just i i don't think that there are really any power forward minutes available for the actual centers like mark and nick richards and so i don't see it coming out of you know, I see the center minutes pie as being legitimately capped at 48, whereas for most teams, you can easily fudge it up to 53 or whatever to, to get some extra minutes to both centers. So I'm a little bit worried about that. I'm a little sure. bit worried about lacking trust in the coaching staff. Uh, if I felt as good as you did about 28 minutes per game, I wouldn't really be be pushing back here. I just... I don't feel good about 28 minutes. I feel good about 25 minutes. I don't feel good about 28. Interesting. All right. So well, I, I, I think if he plays 28, uh, 25, I'd be pretty shocked. But again, this, this is the debate. This is what matters. Like three, four minutes yeah. makes makes a significant difference in that portion yeah. of a draft. Now, I'm going to get back because I want to have a crack at you for one of your big man takes on a second year big man. We'll get to that in a second. I'm sure everyone knows who it is. <laughs> but we're going to talk. I'm going to tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Because you're wearing your bird dog shorts, and I know you are because they feel unbelievably comfortable. That is the key thing here with bird dogs. They look great, but they feel great as well. So no matter what you're doing, whether you're sitting here arguing with someone about fantasy basketball rankings, or you're going to someone's house to have a barbecue, or you're going to the shops to buy stuff for your barbecue, or you're drinking beers at the pub, or whatever it is that you're doing, bird dogs are going to look great and feel great. The most comfortable shorts you will ever wear. So go to birddogs.com. Slash locked on NBA, of course. You enter the pro- promo code locked on NBA. That's another way you can do it. You do that at checkout and you get a free Bird Dogs water bottle. Hydration is awesome. Get that with your order. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA. You get a free water bottle at checkout. You won't want to take your Bird Dogs off. We promise you. All right, here we go. Here we go, Alex, because I've been waiting to do this. You were like, oh, I'm not sure I want to do this one because I've debated this bloke on so many different shows, but we've got to talk. <sighs> We have to talk about Walker Kessler because you are so far up this man's ass. I thought you were going to have him in the top five <laughs> when we talked about Embiid. Ah, Kessler over Embiid, that's the way I'll go. That's what I was prepping for, Alex. But no, you don't have him quite that high. But you do have him very, very close. Some would say uncomfortably close to the second round where you've got him right on the edge there. I Let me I'll, I'll ask you a question in a second, but I'll throw out a couple of things. I think that Walker Kessler is every chance and probably should be the absolute odds-on favorite to lead the league in shot blocks this season. Not going to get mm-hmm. an argument from me out of that. He's an unbelievable shot blocker in college. He did it last season. He's great. Um, he's going to be their starting center, and there is no actual you know, young prospect backup coming. But but there are there is Kelly Linick, who is a massive part of, in terms of the success of Will Hardy's offense, a guy that shoots and spaces and passes, which Kessler and Collins can't do. John Collins has had a lot of his success playing at center as well. And this is not to say that these are, we're not pushing Walker Kessler to play 25 minutes a night. I'm just saying that in terms of him pushing to 33 or 34, those other guys are going to get on the court at some point. But my major issue with Kessler that high is I just think that the, 
the way that, and people have heard me say this a million times, the way that fantasy basketball rankings go is they skew the value of a high blocks player absolutely up the wazoo and it makes them look way better than they are where he's going to give you absolutely no threes assists or steals he's going to be putrid at free throw percentage as well he's going to have some big numbers and he's going to be bad at points rebounds field goals and blocks you're talking about a three category player very strong in those three at the start of round three and it really does hurt your ability to go in those other areas so i am just as a philosophical thing really really cautious about going on those guys whose value comes in those very low volume categories and have these big skews that i think z scores misrepresent so why are you so confident in taking kessler here which honestly i think if you had pick one you would take him on the turn at round two three wouldn't you i'd strongly consider it i haven't done that i haven't been in a draft that high um I do tend to take him in just sort of, I kind of have him penciled in as my third round pick in almost every draft. Um, I I probably need to do some mocks where I experiment and see how often he makes it back to me in the fourth. Because uh, I might be giving up some good value there by always I taking get him 50, better. 50-50, I reckon. Because I've seen him, like, what's his yeah. ADP? I've got it up on the screen there. It's 46. 46. So I think it's probably a 50-50. It depends on the, yeah. the type of league. But I think you'd have a fairly good chance. But is he, again, my philosophy is like, I, if he, if I get him in, if I valued him the way that I that you do, and I'd be sitting there going, well, if I get him in round four, I'm pretty happy with that. But I don't sit yeah. there and go, I absolutely have to because I could say, well, if I don't get him, I'll grab Claxton or I'll grab someone else. I'll grab two of these guys later on or whatever it is. I just don't go. I have to have Walker Kessler. So I want to talk about your your Z score thing for a second because because it's important. I actually, um, you know. Uh, peek behind their hurt and I, I don't listen to all of yours or all of anyone's pods sure. but i i do listen to some and the one you did a couple weeks ago um where you talked about the problems with z scores mm -hmm. legitimately one of the more important pieces of fantasy sports con fantasy basketball content to come out in a while listeners if you skip that one it was at the he'd Josh puts out so many, it's like 25 ago at this point. <laughs> but scroll down, find that one. What's the name of it? Uh, it's a good question. I think it was just called uh, Introducing Durant or something like that. Um, it legitimately a value, very valuable one. One of the things you talk about, yes, you talk about how blocks are overrated in Z-scores, but you also talk about how um, the negative free throw impact is dramatically overrated in yes, Z-scores. Yes. Um, and to the point where Kessler's bad free throw percentage, we it, it's on a low enough volume that we can almost ignore it. Um, and I think, you know, we're looking at a player who blocks don't always scale up for minutes. I think you talked about that yep. with some with another player. With with Kessler, we have a good sample of him at low minutes and then him at a larger minute count. And his blocks per minute rate was almost identical. His block rate is scaling as his workload increases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we can safely pencil him in for a minimum of the 28 minutes per game that he was yep. playing after he became a starter and probably more than that. Um, and I think that it's safe to assume that his block rate will stay as it was or increase. I agree. So we're looking at someone who may lead the league in blocks, agree. is likely to be in the top 10 in rebounds, if not higher, agree. and is likely to be in the top 10 in field goal percentage, if not higher, with the asterisk that as of that's measured by Z-scores, and that's a little funky. That's probably a little overstating it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that getting that kind of dominance can really be good and be valuable in, I don't, there, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of players in the second round this year who are like, they kind of should be first rounders, but they have this really big problem holding them back from being first rounders. But there's a lot of those guys. I don't feel like there are very many guys that I want in the third round this year. And so taking a guy who can completely anchor my team in a couple of categories, including the most scarce category, um, who, I, I'm, I'm happy to lock that in and give my team some strategic direction. I'm perfectly happy to punt points mm -hmm. and um, take Claxton around later. Um, or if I started with Doncic, um, you know, then it, it, then maybe I get someone who's super high in points late, in, you know, in in the second round and in the fourth round, 
and and I'm back to close to break even in points. I, I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of ways you can go. You're locking down such a staple in blocks. And I've heard people say, I, I've heard some people say that they think blocks are going to be a little bit more available this year than they have been in the past. Um, and I think you're asking a lot of rookies to deliver and stay healthy and uh, some questionable coaches to not be questionable coaches for that to come true. So I'm not sure that this blocks renaissance is coming the way some people are. I'm pretty sure. I'll, I'm pretty sure it's going to be more prevalent the last season, even if your know, Wembenyama and Chet don't block three shots a game, which they won't. Um, just having them in the league is is there. Plus, Mark Williams, instead of playing 19 minutes a night, plays 26 or whatever, right? You're getting a bump there. Jalen Duran, instead of playing 25 minutes, might play 28. Um, Brooke Lopez Brooke, finally starts to tail off. That's, well, that's, that's, it's that's, coming on the other end too. Yep, D Daniel Gafford plays more than 24 minutes a night would be the guess yep. there as well. There's there's a lot of different things that can that can happen with that. But yeah, I, I agree. Like, it's not a guarantee. And I, I feel like there's a decent chance of that happening. You're right in terms of getting that anchor, but I'm glad you didn't say that you win that category because it's we know that's not true because yeah. the bloke ahead of you picks Jaron Jackson and then he grabs Klax in the next round and you're already behind on blocks and you know, then yeah. you, you're scrambling. My problem with is you said he's at the top of those categories. So I remember when I looked at it last season, admittedly he played like 23, 24 minutes a night. I think he was bottom five out of the top 200 players in assists, steals, threes, and free throw percentage impact, which is not great, right? That's that's pretty low in those. It's not like he's getting two assists. He's getting like 0.9 or, and he's not hitting a three and his steals were like 0.3, like some putridly low number. Mm -hmm. Which I is think, all, I think his assists, I think his assists hit one once he entered the starting lineup. I can double check that. That's probably, um, that's, that's probably, it's still, it's still incredibly low though. Yeah. Yes, and so look, you're right. It is there is a lot of build stuff there. You've got some really big strengths and some really big weaknesses. Um, I, I would just, I got no problem yeah. getting one, him in the forties. One point two as a starter. Yeah, and and again, he, he only averaged 20, 28 minutes as a starter. That might go up. How so. do you find like it, I did this the other day? I took him in round four in a roto mock draft just to try and see how I could do that build around him. I just found it really tough to get. Um, get some of the other categories back to where they needed to be. I recovered okay, but it was pretty challenging to get some of those, like the hit that I copped in assists, the the, the threes, that, that was easy enough. But some of those other things, like losing points at that area, made it a little bit hard for me to get back to being competitive. That's more roto than head-to-head. -head. Do you just find it, it really mm -hmm. does sort of narrow you into what you're doing though? I mean, it can, definitely. Um, uh I think the I think every I think the only roto mock I've done where I took Kessler I had Doncic um, start which really helps with assists oh, yeah. um, um, to sort of balance out uh, I've done a lot more head to head where I'm able to just pivot to punting one thing or another um, but I do feel like you know there are enough big men who who get some some assists that if you that, that you can um, make it back you know if you pair him with Sabonis for example mm. then you're really not going to be that behind that much behind if in any in assists no um, that puts you into a big punt point situation though because Sabonis is like a 18 19 point yeah. guy too so which is fine but that's totally a way to go I just would rather get him a little bit later and just not want to bank on some of those big categories being where they are and some of those other ones bringing back up but that's just a philosophical thing but we've got one more to talk about and I'm down on this bloke as well it's uh it's Dejounte Murray who's got an ADP of 32 and I will fully admit Alex that I'm just way below him compared to nearly everybody else um, you've got him at a, yeah, a, what in the second, or not second, in the third round, I believe you have, uh, Dejounte Murray. Yeah. So yeah. at the end of the, end of the third and round, the, start of the fourth, the I've got him like at the end of the fourth, start of the fifth. He was a guy that I was very cautious on last season. I was like, Hey, the steals probably aren't going to stick. The assists and rebounds are going to drop. And that all happened. Now I'm very willing to say that his steals could go back up. But I don't think that his assists or his rebounds necess the rebounds might, considering John Collins is gone. But Collins was averaging five rebounds a game over the final thirty games of the season. I just think what Dejounte just... brings, where he's not he's not elite in percentages necessarily. He's actually not great in those, and a lot of those strengths he had weren't there. I love the minutes that he gets. I'm just not sure that 
in round three. I think there are other guys that I'd prefer in that area. Um, and I just think some of the stuff that he brings is probably other guys I'd, that suit it more in, in that sort of zone. I just don't really understand what you see from him that's so much worse than last year. Um, like, I to me, to, to me, he was... Murray was almost someone who was like, all right, you finished, you know, late 30s. I'm just going to put you in the late 30s and I'm going to figure out, like, everything seems the same except with actually the additional, albeit small, but the additional upside of if Trey Murray, if if, um, if, if Trey Young does get traded, um, that would probably be a big boost to Murray. Um now, granted, you know, that's like, what, 10% likelihood, 20% even, likelihood? Mate, it's like a 2% but, chance. There's no way that that's, there's no uh, way that's a 20% chance of Trey Young getting traded. Okay. But whatever that, um, whatever that odds, that likelihood is, um, I think it's, it's more than zero. And mm. there is some amount of upside there that should be factored in. But all, but, but that only like puts, that only stops him from dropping. I already have him a couple spots below ADP and a couple spots be- below where he finished last year, you just have him way down from last year. And I didn't really understand what changed. Okay, let me tell you that I don't actually have him down from last year because it's to do with the way that I assess rankings because I've got him averaging the same points, 0.23s less, the same rebounds, the same assists, similar steals, a slightly higher field goal percentage, basically the same. But I didn't view him as a guy in the 30s last season because I'm always going to be looking at punting turnovers. I'm going to be downweighting some of the defensive stats because of the variance on a week-to-week basis. So I had mm-hmm. him, like in my rankings last season, over the final two months, he was the 83rd ranked player. And he was 114th over the last month and he was 44th for the season. And I've got him 50, 50 years or whatever it is now. Um, so it's just, it's more of a, a way we're approaching this guy. Like I um, don't have him actually dropping that much from last season. And the other thing I would say about him is that that contract that he signed, that extension suggests to me that, um, or they, they're not viewing him at that max player anymore. And he doesn't view himself at that. Otherwise he wouldn't have picked up a player, player option and extended is that, that maybe we can all speculate. Maybe Trey's going to trade the hand over to, to, to DeJounte. They didn't value him as that player in that contract uh, extension negotiation. They didn't. It's a, it's a fine contract, but I don't think anyone would argue, Alex, that it's like an overpay. I think everyone would say that's a pretty good deal for Atlanta. And when a player agrees to a pretty good deal, that means that there's something else going on there, I think. I don't know what it is, but it's something that suggests that maybe the way that he is being valued is not as high as we think it might be. Reasonable. Um, all, all the things you're saying makes sense um i i think that um we and i i used to make this mistake a lot and i think i've been pretty good but all all of us are subject to it on some level um you know the coach isn't sitting there with the salary cap spreadsheet when he's making decisions that is true and we we as a fantasy community often overrate the value of um, what happened in the off season in terms of how that will impact coaching decisions during the year. I think um, my, my decision, my point there is more on whether they're looking to trade Trey and cause they fully believe in DeJounte yeah. being that number one guy. And I'd say, yeah, I'm not sure they really do believe in DeJounte at that number one guy or, or that he thought that anyone else believed in him at that level of player, given the fact that he took that extension. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. I think, you know, there was some talk about this uh, right after the season, and it kind of died down over the summer. But, like, you know, are the Hawks committed to Trey long term? Not about whether mm. they're pivoting to DeJounte, but just, you know, are is now the time to sell on Trey um, because you don't see him quite as much quite as highly as you used to. And maybe you think you can get better value for him now than you used to not because they're pivoting to Murray, which two years ago, you know, when they first acquired Murray, we were like, Oh, or if they trade Trey, it will be to pivot to Murray. Maybe it's not to pivot to Murray. Maybe it's just maximizing value. Look to be, to be clear on this, like I have always been lower on Murray than everybody. Like I was like, wow, they paid way too much for him. He's not this good. He had all these numbers inflated because the Spurs were just making everything about Mm -hmm. him and look how well that team played. Like they they were bad. And then he regressed back. 
uh, the last two months of last season, which is basically uh, an equivalent to when Quinn Snyder took over, this is what he averaged in 36 minutes. 19 points, 1.2 triples, under five rebounds, 5.6 assists, 1.3 steals, 0.1 blocks. He's a puny blocks guy. 47 from the field, 82 from the line on only 2.5 free throw attempts. That was, according to the way that I'm looking at rankings, not a top 80 player. There's nothing that is exciting about those numbers to me. And that's with Quinn Snyder. Now, no full off season, different system, whatever. But yep. that went down. Everything got worse as the season went on for him. Um, I was looking into that, and a lot of what got worse appears to be a shooting slump. That kind of a yes, um, three, three point shooting was terrible. In, it kind of starts right around when Quinn arrives. Yeah. Um, but yep. I don't think that we should assume that that's going to necessarily be the new normal. I agree. Um, and his his shot attempts from the field was stable. It's just he was making fewer threes, and so he shot a few fewer threes. Um, the rebounds went down a little, but but not by a ton in that. So, no. um, so but to, to tie it back to, like, m- trying to make a, a pro DeJounte case, um, I, I do see value in him in um, – when you're if if you if you feel really good about your first couple picks and you're trying to maintain flexibility as you continue to build your team, uh, you know, other than blocks, he is. I, I see. I look at you know, um, looking at his season averages here: twenty points, five rebounds, six assists, more than one steal, decent enough um, shooting. I look at that as this is someone who doesn't tie me in any direction. A guard sure. who doesn't block shots, we know how to deal with that. Um, I, I view this as someone who helps me a little bit in basically everywhere. He's not going to win me anything, but he he maintains my flexibility. If I feel really good, um, you know, there are years where I've got like four or five guys who I think are super undervalued, and I'm getting them in the 80s and 90s every draft. And if I feel if I'm in that situation this year, I don't feel that way right now but if i'm in that situation and i'm just trying to maximize flexibility um if i really like my first two picks i, I do see murray as a good person for that yeah i got to look it makes it sound like i think that he's shit and he's not worth it like i think he's like he could be your fifth player on your fantasy team and even if you want to take him in round end of round four i actually think whatever like it's it's totally fine it's more that i'm not going up into a round three zone for him alex the last question is before it goes too long would you take Deshante murray or al horford first <laughs> I love my. I love me. I love I, me. Some I know. I, it's the first time I think we've done this where we haven't had a debate on uh, Al Horford's value uh, on this show. So I, just, I wanted to just bring his bring his name up, but that doesn't. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. We're, uh, we're, we have to bring up the uh, the old man because uh, yeah, he's he's gonna he's gonna be gone from the NBA soon. Alex, that that brings us to the end of this show. Tell people what you've got coming uh, at the moment over on Rotowire. Um. Yeah. Uh, at Reclean on on Twitter or X. Um, I'm on Rotowire during the season. I got my weekly CBS waiver column coming out. Um, I'm not doing a ton during this preseason. Um, but um, yeah, the you know follow me on Twitter and I'll publish stuff as it comes out. Go do that. Go follow Alex. Thank you again for coming on and having a chat to me and uh, yeah, taking Thanks some for having some, me. some lighthearted uh, light lighthearted ribbing. I think is what the what the kids would call it, Alex. Thanks for having me. And that will do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on Odyssey and on YouTube. Please thumb it up. Leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.